Welcome to History Hack. If you didn't know by now, we are the revolution. That means we're sharp, witty, lots of fun, but it also means that we're essentially the peasants in Les Mis huddled round a table in the corner of the bar with no money. If you enjoy the show, please do support us. We have a Patreon account by which you can donate a small monthly sum in appreciation of what you're hearing. Alternatively, we have Ko-fi in which you can just do a one-off donation as a thank you if you particularly enjoy a certain episode. Either way, we massively appreciate all of your support. Hope you enjoy the show. Hello and welcome to another episode of History Hack. I'm thrilled to be going into Stuart Times today. Yes, this is Charlotte with you as ever dragging you kicking and screaming into the 17th century but we're going right at the beginning so you can't you can't be too upset with me um so i'm joined today by stephen vera pen he teaches in the department of english at the university of strathclyde and has written a number of historical novels including a series of crime mysteries set in tudor england in which we sincerely hope that everyone except tom cromwell and anne of cleves meets a grisly end in addition to his academic work, Stephen is one of the <laughs> amazing contributors to Ian Dale's soon-to-be-released Kings and Queens, um, along with everybody who's on this call. Um, <laughs> and he's here today to tell us about... <laughs> we're all in. We're yes. all in Ian Dale's book, aren't we, Alex? <laughs> so we're We are indeed, yeah. Representing um, Charles II and Queen Victoria, Alex and I. Um, he's here today to tell us about his subject in that book and the subject of his latest non-fiction release, The Wisest Fool, The Lavish Life of James VI and First. Hello, Stephen. Oh, thank you very much for having me. Appreciate it. <laughs> We're really excited to have you here um, because uh, both Alex and I are just always upset, shall we say, that the Tudors get so much attention and we don't frankly. Um, so James receives much less popular attention than his Tudor predecessors. Why Why do you think that is, poor Jamie Sext? Uh, well, that's an interesting question, and I should be able to answer it because I was one of those people for years and years and years. I would read about the Tudors, I would watch TV shows about Henry VIII, Elizabeth I, and then I lost interest when it came to James. I almost had a perception, you know, that's the boring bit. It's somehow <laughs> got boring after Elizabeth. Why did I think that? And I think, not to sort of blame the media, but growing up, there was just a lot more Tudor material to consume. Yeah. The TV shows, the movies, all of this stuff. So I think that there's more interest in the Tudors because people are given more to mm -hmm. consume. But of course, that's kind of looking at it an odd way because the media will be responding to demand I suppose mm. so it might be a more of a, a symptom than a cause that there's so much to their stuff I actually think it's to do with iconography ultimately I think James and quite a few of the Stuarts uh, they suffer because they don't have the iconic images you know the Holbein portrait of Henry VIII everyone knows it at first sight uh, the Armada portrait of Elizabeth, everyone knows it. And then James, there are a lot of lovely images of James, but there's nothing really iconic in terms of paintings. There's not one painting you can point at and say, oh, it's James, it's King James, the sixth and first. Uh, so the media probably really ran with the Tudors because people already knew them by sight. They knew those iconic images. Yeah. So maybe that's it. Maybe there's a... a perception that James isn't interesting because he doesn't have the, the famous image. Yeah, I think also, you know, not, not sort of knocking the school system in any way, because you, you can only teach a certain amount to mm. children. Mm. Um, but we are taught, you know, very much the, the Tudors. Um, and then, then Elizabeth doesn't have children and James end scene. <laughs> so, yes, yeah. <laughs> so like a little uh, bit of a you know, it's like there's this watershed moment and um and we we sort of he's almost a transitional monarch because Charles the first, of course, has the has the wars and yeah. loses his head, and that's a you know fantastic story. Um but James doesn't get you know, he doesn't get sort of the same the same kind of attention. So what do you think the public 
perception of James is and why why do you think that emerged because the the wisest fool seems I mean it's a little harsh yes um, the wisest fool and um the title of the book obviously is drawn from that famous quote about James which comes from the uh, Anthony Weldon description of James Anthony Weldon was a courtier in the 17th century who wrote the court and character of King James which satirized King James and made really the biggest impression and the most lasting impression. So it's from that text that we get the kind of infamous image of James as this doddering, drooling, codpiece scratching weirdo. <laughs> and that is unfortunately really stuck. <laughs> I love um, it. I want to have yeah. a t-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> So he describes him as fiddling with his codpiece. And... Yeah, why put that in? It's such a weird thing, which <laughs> makes me think maybe it was true. Uh, but even if it was, I mean, even if any of that was true, and some of it wasn't, some of it we know wasn't, mm. but if any of it was, it was a description of James in his later years. So to take that as this is what he was like is like taking the John Harrington image of Elizabeth I, who was supposedly wandering about, raving in our palaces, stabbing the arises out of paranoia. Um, yeah, with a boob hanging out and black stumps yeah, where her teeth were, yeah. that's it. Pull, pulling it? down her top to uh, show her uh, cleavage. Classy. Sounds like image. a night out in Croydon. <laughs> 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 or, never is a Glasgow Croydon reference Glasgow. for you, looks like a night out outside the garage at one in the morning in Glasgow. God, that takes me back. It's still there. <laughs> with it's the same still there. Off it's the front. Still yeah. um, Sorry, I, I had that conversation the other week. I thought I said, someone mentioned it. I said, is that still there? <laughs> it is. Was my early 20s. Was same. <laughs> same. One pound 50 for <laughs> vodka and coke. Sorry, we've diverted. <laughs> is it fair? I mean, so we're, we're talking about it. You know, him in later life, perhaps, with his fingers that walk forever towards his codpiece. Mm. Um, this this kind of satire of him becomes becomes what we know of him. Yeah, I think maybe he was hampered as well because he came to the English throne in his late thirties. So there was there's not really that you know with Henry VIII, there's the, the kind of contrast between the young Renaissance prince and then the bloated old tyrant. With Elizabeth, there's the young a princess, the Lady Elizabeth, and then the later Queen in the 1590s. James is kind of just seen as this stodgy middle-aged figure because not that many people know about his reign in Scotland compared to England. Can I ask, just as a moron in this century then, is there a disconnect between perceptions of him on both sides of the border? I don't think so, no, because I have to say... Scottish education, I don't remember learning very much about him at all. Wow. That's interesting that he's not like, that you don't have a different perception in Scotland because they had been in the public eye longer. Yeah, yeah. Since he was a baby. Yeah, the cradle king, as he called himself. Um, so, so, yeah, that is, it's, I wouldn't say there is a particular Scottish perception of James. Um in fact, I know that the historian, the late historian Jenny Wormald, she was a huge fan of his, and yeah. she was kind of taking to task the idea that he was just this drilling incompetent oddball. So that was clearly a problem in Scotland as well yeah. as in England, that that's what people thought. <laughs> that's a PhD for someone else. That's not our problem. <laughs> so what was... We're looking at, you know, this is a, a long life and any any monarch who dies in his own bed is a success by default. You know, yes. <laughs> always a good thing. Um, what was his childhood like? And what was his relationship like with his mother? Because, you know, your mum's Mary, Queen of Scots. Those are shoes mm. to fill, right? Yes, yes. Um, and again, so strange. She's so famous and so iconic. And yet people seem to then just sort of not talk about her son very much, which is <laughs> odd. But, I mean, they had no real relationship because um, he was a baby when she lost the throne of Scotland, fled to England, was in prison. Um, there were attempts during his childhood, on her part certainly, to communicate with him. They did exchange letters back and forth up until the mid-1580s. 
But I, you wouldn't call it a relationship, really, because he didn't know her. And because he was brought up as a very Protestant king, he was encouraged by his tutors to hate her, to fear her, to think she was evil. Um, so I think the fact that he would then go on to establish a sort of long distance correspondence at all shows that it didn't really work. And of course, when he went to England, he had her reinterred in Westminster. He had this fabulous tomb built. So my one of the things that I talk about in the book, and I think is that James, because he had no real close family in Scotland, he became obsessed with the idea of family. He really wanted to view himself as a patriarch, as yeah. um, a man of a family, a dynast. And um, part of it was a real interest in his mother and trying to find out the truth about his mother and all of that sort of stuff. Yeah, because of course, I mean, he, he never knew his father because his father yes. famously, um, his house blew up and he's found outside <laughs> strangled. Happens, I mean, the accidents happen, right? All the yeah, time. yeah. Now, they're darnly someone that um, has never really had many defenders. <laughs> Even James never really said anything about Darnley, particularly. I mean, Darnley is a, a fascinating character, worthy of worthy of much more um, looking at than, yeah, than yeah. he gets, because, of course, he's got a claim to the throne of his own, and it's almost like a slight trolling of Elizabeth for Mary to marry him yeah. and... And it clearly doesn't work out. And she even mm. has to, when James is born, she mm. makes this big announcement, doesn't she? Mary, Queen of Scots, to say, he's actually your son. He's definitely, yeah. yes. definitely your son. Nobody else's. Yeah, she said, um, he's so much your son, it will be the worst for him in the future. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I feel really sorry for him. He's definitely <laughs> yours. Don't listen to what everybody else is saying. He's definitely your son. Yeah, because James was dogged by rumours that he was um, Rizzio's, secretly Rizzio's love child. But all you have to really do is look at the portraits of the young James and it looks like Darnley. <laughs> I mean, it looks like the portraits of Darnley. So. I mean, look, for all the, all the things you could say about Mary, Queen of Scots, I don't think she'd be that stupid. Just yeah. to risk putting a cuckoo in the nest. She was not, <laughs> that, she was not that woman. Um but yeah, James's early life is is fascinating, of course, because you know the the power of the um, the regency that springs up around him. All these people. I mean, I I just imagine someone like John Knox being absolutely beside himself the minute Mary, this queen that he thinks is such an unnatural thing, sort of having to defer to a woman this is not on this is not the way that god planned things all of a sudden we have an heir we have a legitimate heir oh and it's a boy fantastic mm -hmm. so she is ousted very soon after yes. after james is born and he's he's raised by this sort of succession of fighting nobles it's almost like becomes he's raised amidst clan wars isn't he yeah yeah um he was raised at sterling castle and he was tutored, educated, given a really top quality for the day education, but it was very much, as I said, as a, a Protestant prince, they wanted to, I guess, experiment. Mm. Um, one of the things that was flourishing in Scotland at the time was classical um, republicanism, I suppose you would yeah. call it. And it was, who is really in charge here? Should it be the church? Should it be the king? Who should be in the driving seat? Should these things be kept separate? So James became really an experiment in how can we make the perfect Protestant king, the perfect Protestant prince. It didn't <laughs> work because he ended up, it almost backfired because James then really rebelled against this idea that he was being pushed towards, which is you are the servant of the people. James would come to think the opposite. as <laughs> No, God appointed me, I'm in charge. I talk about a 180. Yeah, yeah. Dear me. So that's always the danger, I suppose. If you try and really indoctrinate a child and a teenager, you might end up with doing the opposite. Because he's really raised in it. I mean, this is, you know, in many ways, we, we forget that Protestantism has extremists like yeah. any other religion. I mean, this is like, you know, at, at one point, it's, it's kind of, is it, would it, is it fair to say that sort of Taliban levels of sort of really doctrine strict 
dour you know that, that he's being raised in in a, in a protestant sense yes i think that's probably fair to say um it did become i mean scotland took the reformation hard and one of the problems that james faced throughout his reign in scotland was the unfinished business of the Reformation. So the Reformation had been established in Scotland when Mary, Queen of Scots, was still in France. She came back to a, a newly reformed country. But the actual governance of that country and the governance of the, the Kirk, it was called in Scotland rather than the church, was unfinished business. So there were constant debates and fights about what is the place of the Kirk in Scotland now? Should it be the one in charge? Should the king be separate from it? Or from James's perspective, no, the church Kirk should be under me. He wanted a, I suppose, an English style reformation where the monarch was the supreme governor or supreme head of the church. The Kirk was very much against that, or at least the, the extreme elements were very much against that. So, no, absolutely, we do not want a king in, as our governor. It should be Presbyteries that the Presbyterians were arguing. Oh. <laughs> this is almost ca a case of like let's have less religion and more sex, which is a reverse of uh, yeah, something we exactly. were talking about earlier. James had a famous early relationship with his glamorous cousin Esme Stewart. Um, can you tell us about it? What do we know about it really? Yeah, so this is another example of James's weird incestuous fascination with family. But one of the things that I argue in the book is that. He was a child when his cousin Esme Stewart, so Esme Stewart was um, on his paternal side of the family. He'd been born and raised in France. He was, a, for all intents and purposes, a Frenchman, but he was a Stuart. So he came to Scotland in the late 1570s. In his 30s, Esme was, in his late 30s, and all of a sudden he started, I would argue, grooming this 12, 13-year-old James. Um, he became very close. He was suddenly showered with honours. James became smitten. And I think it's probably similar to the way Elizabeth I was treated by Thomas Seymour. I think there's a parallel there. We now, I think, appreciate that. And that was, we now call it grooming. It was an adult who was taking advantage of a young teenager, sort of encouraging their attentions, um, spoiling them just stuff that is, is really kind of unpleasant to think about now um that has been appreciated now with elizabeth i don't think it has been with james um esme stewart was using him for office for power for influence james thankfully i don't think ever really understood that he was just um bowled over that there's this attractive um elegant older man who's showering him with attention who's treating him not like the sort of dour regents had treated him but um encouraging him you know giving him lots of attention telling him how powerful he is and even then one of the things we see in that early relationship that just recurred through james's life is that he would often refer to himself as your dad to people that he had a sexual relationship a, a love affair with it's like again family so obsessed weirdly yeah. with family yeah he's a he's crown daddy I mean, <laughs> it's all it's all good but i mean this it really is fascinating and i really appreciate your you know, you're taking your time and you actually deal with it very sensitively in the book because um there have been throughout the years many sort of um what I would describe as very uninformed um, views on on the the relationship with with Esme and the fact that um, that because it was a homosexual relationship that this of course then in some way oh well that's that's why why of course he would go on to have relationships with men because it was almost at, because it was at this very um, tender age mm -hmm. that that then led to it. But you you describe obviously his sexuality as being a very fluid thing like we now appreciate it is um so that his experiences with esme just were just just happened to be with a glamorous older man mm. that was just just how it was yeah um i mean i think in terms of sexuality james was definitely bisexual yeah um, 
I think he had a romantic preference for men, but his actual uh, sexual interest for, I mean, he, he'd cast a wide net <laughs> 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 who he was. But I have to say, him, in that period, he, he, wouldn't have thought, he wouldn't have thought that that sort of made him different from anyone else. Rather, I mean, his kingship did that, I think. The identity, the only identity that James really cared about was, I'm king. <laughs> that, that was his identity. I identify as king. As king, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Good enough for him. <laughs> I love that. I think that's absolutely wonderful. Um, and you know, his his relationships throughout his life are the subject of um you know, we we don't know. We, yeah. there, there is no way of knowing what went on in James's bedroom. Safe to say that there are people who went in there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. But he was a very tactile man, so I don't think he would have been content to just hold hands with him. <laughs> <laughs> now, look, regardless of regardless of preference, and and you you do describe um, very well, sort of you know the um, the the differences between sort of a sexual attraction and love and mm. um, and companionship and all these sort of different layers. Regardless of any preference. James has to marry. That's yeah. non-negotiable. So who did he choose and what was his marriage like? Well, um, eventually he went for Anna of Denmark, the daughter of Frederick II. He'd initially been thinking of marrying her sister, but there were so many delays that he fell to uh, the second princess, it fell to Anna. He married her and there's been quite a lot written in the past about their relationship. There's been a lot think of incorrect stuff said about Anna as well. If you go back to the Victorian, certainly they just wrote her off. She was stupid. She was an airhead. She couldn't keep his attention because he was an intellectual. She was an idiot. And none of that's true. I mean, if you look at it. Recently, there's been more of a turn towards looking at her literary interests, her patronage of writers, her interest in the arts, which is all there. I think now we're hopefully starting to look at our political influence as well as that direct political influence. So what was their relationship like? Um, maybe this is one of the reasons that she's not given the attention of Henry VIII's wives. It was happy. <laughs> I mean, it, was, it, it had its ups, it had its downs. They had their disagreements, for example, over the raising of uh, their son, their eldest son, Prince Henry. But it was a contented marriage. It was a successful marriage. And I think maybe there's less copy generally to be printed about a successful marriage than there is about one that ends in a beheading or something. Yeah. Like but so they married when she she was very young, wasn't he? And he she was 15. Yeah. yeah. Big romantic gesture that he made. Yes. Um, because there were storms, wild, freakish storms, uh, which uh, apparently were caused by witches. He, she couldn't sail directly from um, Denmark, Norway. So he, in this romantic gesture, decided to sail out and bring her home. And he did. He risked his life, I suppose, going out himself, wedding her again. So they'd been married by proxy. He went to marry her in person. Then they married again by different rights uh, and had a high old time in uh, Denmark. I, lo I love this idea of marriage by proxy. It's just like, you, <laughs> you send your mate, <laughs> they... They get married to your fiance, and then you have to lie on a bed together. Get like, your leg out. <laughs> get, get your leg, your leg out. out. <laughs> it's very, very odd. Very, very <laughs> odd and completely wonderful. But you touched there on something that is really, I mean, of all the legacies of James the First's reign that we can we can see tangible evidence of in the, the centuries that that come after. Um is this fascination with witches. This is this yes. is bad stuff, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, and that's probably one, two things I think James is generally really well known for. One is the King James Bible. The other is he's the witches guy. <laughs> he's the guy that's obsessed with witches. And it came after that marriage, after that marriage took place. And it began in Denmark. So there was a, a bit of a, a witch craze and a witch hunt in Denmark. Oh, wow. And it was imported over to Scotland in the wake of James coming back. The blame was given for the storms in Denmark on witches. And that news obviously carried over the 
uh, over the sea and James started his own witch hunt, which obviously was terrible. Uh, yeah. Because not just for the witches, sorry, the, the women and men accused at that time, but it went on, it snowballed and it went on for, for decades, as you say, it became a, a horrific legacy. Yeah, I mean, he gave, he almost provided royal assent, didn't he, to to yeah. the the hunting and the absolute provision of no quarter to anybody yeah. who's been... I mean, he, he didn't invent it, I should say. It was not as if he, he started what I would call the witch case, and it became, as I say, it became widespread. But there had been legislation years before him against witches, accused witches, so he was kind of taking advantage of um, existing legislation and expanding it, yeah. but yeah, it became a very dark legacy. And he had the cheek, <laughs> he had the cheek to kind of use his intellect to try and distinguish false claims from or false accusations from true accusations. Yeah. And funnily enough, the true accusations were always the ones where witches had supposedly been active against him personally. <laughs> All the false ones were about other people. It's, no, this is just a false accusation. It's unimportant. Then it, if you say to him, oh, but they were going to kill you, these witches. Oh, right, okay, it's true. Burn them, hang them. <laughs> it's And a lot of the techniques um, for you know, for discovering witches are very much laid out in, he, he writes the book on it, but it becomes like a manual. Actually, so yeah. <laughs> later on, it's like, this is this is the book that you read if you want to find a witch. And one of the, you know, the, the keeping them awake that's the yes absolute torture, torture um psychological torture physical torture it was awful but i suppose then it, it was perceived as a real thing i mean it was a, yeah it was a real thing it's easy now to look back and, and be horrified by it, throw our hands up at how awful the treatment of these people was but in those days i suppose it would you know this is a real thing they, they have real power. They are really doing evil. It was, it was believed. And like you said, he is an intellectual. So James is, I mean, he's he's raised in this way. He speaks all these languages. He's a mm. he's a very intellectual presence. I mean, when he goes to when he goes to pick up his wife, doesn't he give like a three hour? Oh yes, he gives yes. a three hour yeah. Latin um, yeah. a sort of speech to to people. Yeah, I'm glad that hasn't survived. <laughs> oh, you it. don't want to listen to it. No, you don't want to sit no. there for three You're hours. You're okay. <laughs> Thanks, James. Um, he got a, a reward for it. I think they gave him a gold cup, so it could, unless that was just flannel. But, um, <laughs> he won the World Cup of talking <laughs> three hours in Latin. Um, but again, that's actually a good point, Charlotte, because he's one of the things from the Weldon text is James was unable to speak properly. His tongue was too big for his mouth. I think, well, yeah. That, really isn't true if he was delivering three hour speeches speaking before parliament for hours at a time amazing so he clearly could talk yeah yeah he talked too much was probably the problem <laughs> so james had long coveted the english throne because he's got mm. a really good claim to it it's not just sort of it's not just looking across the border and thinking i fancy some of that oh, he's got that yeah he's got a really good claim to it so what's his relationship like with elizabeth the first he must have i mean he must have been furious with her when she cut his mum's head off right he must have been royally pissed off yes that the relationship with elizabeth is probably my favorite and it was my favorite today about because um they, they didn't have the term frenemies but i think that's <laughs> what we are they deeply distrusted one another. I think they, they secretly disliked one another. Life would have been easier if they had been different people. At the same time, they were locked together by religion. They had a sneaking regard for one another. It was just such a... a on two occasions, actually, a marriage mitted between them despite the age difference. What was the age difference? What, what were we kind of looking at? When he's marriageable age. Years, over 30 years. Yeah. Um, so that relationship, I think Elizabeth would never recognise him publicly as her heir. Uh, that would, from her perspective, that would have been like telling England 
yeah, you can stop listening to me. He's the guy that's going to be coming in. Go and go and pay attention to him. Um, mm. From James's perspective, it was his legal right. But James and Mary Queen of Scots before him, I think, were kind of playing her game in this. What they should have done, had they been wiser, was say nothing and just, like, they did not need, as it turns out, as 1603 showed, they didn't need her to designate someone as her heir. They needed enough of the nobility, enough of the council to accept them. Mm -hmm. So uh, James's importuning, his constant importuning of Elizabeth, make me your heir, announce that I'm your heir, give me some legal documentation that I'm your heir. <laughs> when you're reading it, you always think, shut up, James, you're playing <laughs> into hand. You don't need this. I mm -hmm. So, yeah, really... Elizabeth really uh, played with this idea that it's in my control who my heir is. I get to decide. But the same woman, when um, her sister Mary had died, had said, I don't need to thank her for designating me her heir. It's God decided. It was uh, the law decided. But yet she would pretend it was within her gift when it came to James and Mary Queen of Scots. Incredible. Like you say, it's a... You very much keeping keeping the reins of power but there's realistically for James there's there's nobody else is there there's nobody there's no one sort of waiting in the wings there's no rival faction well there were quite a few potential rivals one of them was his cousin Darnley's brother's daughter Arbella <laughs> um but seriously I think there weren't because he was the one that was in communication first with Essex and then with Cecil he was the one so working the political angle. So it was increasing. The, and you can almost see Cecil in the early 1600s getting like low-key pissed off with James, almost saying, stop annoying Elizabeth. Just let me deal with it. Stop <laughs> asking her. It will happen. I'll manage things. And that's what happened. Yeah. I mean, the, you share some of the letters, you know, extracts from the letters between the two of them and also a wonderful letter between his queen, so the queen, Queen Anna and mm. um, Queen Elizabeth, where she's sort of pointing out to Elizabeth how how blessed we've just been with a son. Um, yeah. Oh, isn't this wonderful? Look at us. Yeah. Got got yeah. the whole succession sewn up here. Yeah, yeah. And that was the big selling point of, of James and Anna. And when he married Anna, it became her fight as well. It became, she was just as invested in succeeding Elizabeth as James was. But yeah, you can... Sort of see Elizabeth gritting her teeth when she's writing the congratulations like <laughs> So Elizabeth dies. She's she goes to her deathbed not saying anything, though her counsel will say that she she mm -hmm. sort of made a she made a little noise she, when they uh, mentioned uh, yeah. James. Um did he succeed smoothly to the English crown or was there any pushback? He succeeded smoothly. Uh, there was no um, fight against it, there was no pushback. In fact he wrote that he was delighted with his ride down through England because the people rushed to meet him with sparkles of affection. <laughs> so he had, he had a way all the time. He loved it. Uh, there was no uh, pushback. I think people were relieved that it not just had been taken care of without civil war, without fighting, without factional battles or anything, um, but also that here was a a family man. So after these years of uncertainty with uh, an elderly woman with no child, no direct hair or anything, he is a family man. He's already got sons. It's, it, this is stability. Yeah, I mean, you can see that see that sort of succession. You see it now when um, you know in in the last years of the the Queen's life when she slimmed down those kind of balcony appearances with the royal family yeah. of look here is my heir, here is yeah. his heir, and here is his air, we're sorted. Yes, but yes, yeah, so they still yeah. do take advantage of that. You know, the, the photographs and things. Here's the the future. Yeah. So, so it's almost like you see that, but there's just. I think he was smart though, because I think that he, you know, even though it was smooth and there was no pushback, he left his family in Scotland and he did that first ride down to London to claim his capital on his own, didn't he? Yes, he did, and I think that's something that's kind of overlooked in the idea that. Because again, going back to that Weldon text with all the 
mockery of him, the stereotype of him. One of the stereotypes is, oh, he was a frightful coward. He was scared of everything. Well, when he succeeded in Scotland, we know it all went smoothly and everyone was rushing out to greet him and cheer him. But when he left Scotland, he could have no idea of what reception he would meet. I mean, he might have, I don't know, reached Durham or York, wherever, and suddenly been attacked. <laughs> he didn't know. He couldn't know. Um, so he was quite brave in that sense. Brave, of course, as well for going out and bringing back Anna back in 1590. Because, of course, I mean, we we jumped very much over the early early years of his life, which makes up the bulk of his time mm. it was his time as as king of scots from being a cradle king to to this point he'd had to deal with so many threats on his person he'd been um he'd been abducted he'd been locked up um is it is it glams who stops him leaving leaving his room <laughs> yeah. with a who was the leg over the door and what let him through. when i when i read that when you said that he prevents him from leaving with his leg over the door i'm sort of imagining this very sort of cabaret <laughs> moment with a, a beautifully sort of stockinged leg not letting him yes in. and james, um, I always, james could have just vaulted over it surely he I mean, did her, but he knows that he you know he is very much at the mercy of of powerful families and powerful mm. factions yeah 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 so as not even just as a child as a teenager even in, throughout his 20s throughout his marriage to anna in the early years there were fights with the earl of bothwell who was Mary Queen of Scots' husband's nephew, mm. nephew to that bottle, uh, who was constantly attacking them when they were first married. And he eventually was accused of being a witch, I should say. But um, he, he never really knew security in Scotland until really the last few years there. And even then, it was, he was worried about not just noble insurrections, but Presbyterians, mounting challenges to his, his rule. Yeah. He, I think one of the reasons he loved the idea of England is because he had the wrong idea of England. He thought, right, I've been governing Scotland now since since I was a kid. <laughs> I mean, and it's been torture. <laughs> it's been hard. I've had to fight with people. I've been in fear of my life. Oh, now I've got the English throne. England settled. England obeys its monarch. England is ideal. And that actually caused problems later because England had England was a complex country. England had its own difficulties, its own challenges. Parliament was growing in power. Um, James, though, I think almost felt, I've done the hard part. I've governed Scotland. I've brought Scotland to heel. Now I can enjoy myself in England. <laughs> I'm on to my reward. Oh. I'd, I'd love to drill down into this because I just reading this, I just can't figure out how these families are just, they're so powerful and they are, they just are constantly pushing their luck. It's just, it's one revolt after another, after another and short of the well, reasons. Yeah, that's one of the things well, I think I, I talked about in the book because, <laughs> because it just baffles me to no end is they are constantly, lots of these families are constantly launching, as you see, these revolts, these rebellions. And I always wonder, what is the end game here? Because it's not to kill them. They want to keep them alive. But they must know that if they kidnap him, if they force so changes of government on him, he's still going to be there at the end of it. And he's probably going to be resentful of having been kidnapped or having been forced to change his government. So what is the end game here? One of the weird things I think about rebellions is that you don't intend to kill the king. They just sort of want to make him their king. Yeah, yeah. Have the top job. And they, yeah. it's almost by securing the king's person that they yes. do that. But I, I, you'd think they would learn from the fact that even if you secure the king's person for a while, he's going to be free at some point and then he's coming for you, which he, he did. <laughs> yeah it is seriously isn't it? it's like hedging your bets to make sure you don't end up on the wrong side yeah, yeah. um is he considered a good king of scotland uh, how did his people feel about him up in sticks and going down to england now, see, this is a, a really interesting question to me because was he considered a good king it depends who you asked to are you would you be asking the presbyterians who 
really hated monarchy and we're saying oh, some of them some of the extreme ones were saying all oh, monarchs are devil's bairns they're all evil <laughs> um or the common people who launched no particular revolts against him one way of looking at it, i suppose is look at what happened after he left scotland and went to england now if if he hadn't been a good king of scotland would some of the remaining noble families not have you know, taken advantage of his absence, you know, mounted rebellions, tried takeovers. It didn't happen. So after his rule in Scotland, he had, as he boasted, settled Scotland. It seemed relatively peaceful. Now, you wouldn't have thought that if you look at Mary Queen of Scots' reign, if you look at James's first, say, 20 years, you would have thought, oh God, when he goes, there's going to be all fighting will continue, the noble factions will continue but nothing happened it was settled um, fairly well two ways i guess you could look at that you could think right once he went to england those factious nobles that he'd left behind in scotland well we didn't want to piss him off because he's now got england and he's now got ireland and he's now got he's got, he's got um, all this other power behind him so it could be that but I tend to think, you know, I tend to actually give him the credit and think, you know, he did a good job and he settled Scotland um, because the threat of England and Ireland, it certainly didn't stop Scotland rising in rebellion against his son Charles. So. I was going to say all those, um, all those lovely sort of family feuds are going to come back because, you know, as someone who who spends a lot of time later in the, the Wars of the Three Kingdoms, um, looking at Looking at this, it's just like, yeah, okay, I know what happens to his son. I know what happens to his yeah, son. Yeah. <laughs> you sort of you you recognise all the old sort of the you know, family arguments that are going to come yes, out. We get into sort of the Covenanters Wars and the, the Bishops yeah. Wars and the, the everything that's going to come up. That's very much its own product sure, yeah, yeah. of all these these people who hate each other. They're <laughs> they're just going to get right. Okay, oh, we're having a fight. Are we brilliant? Excellent. <laughs> This one killed my dad. I'm going to sort him out right now. <laughs> I always think that with Essex, it's always so interesting that son of Elizabeth's Essex, yeah. look, he's around it. He's... <laughs> Absolutely hilarious. Um, so coming back to England, what what are James's main policies when he comes down? Because I very much imagine him, and I know this has been the, the impression of him, that he's like some sort of lotto lout, that he's one big, he comes out and he's doing like, he's like making it rain, there's just money in there. <laughs> it's like, okay, oh, you want to be the earl? You can be an earl. You can be a duke. Everybody's having a party. Oh, but yeah, he, must yeah. have, he must have had some policies. What was he up to? Uh, so when he wasn't partying, when he wasn't decking himself out in diamonds and jewels and things, um, his main policies were peace. So he wanted to bring Elizabeth's war with Spain, which had been rumbling on. So there'd been a Cold War and then actual mm-hmm. war war since the mid-1580s, he brought that to a close. He really wanted to present himself as the peacemaker of Europe. And that's understandable, I think, because as we spoke about, he'd seen lots of conflict in Scotland. He had had enough of conflict. He wanted to be an arbiter of peace. He also, I think, really wanted Christian peace. So he wanted not just secular peace between countries, but uh, if that was even possible because there were so many religious wars. But he wanted to bring the Protestant sects together in some kind of unity as a prelude to making some sort of compact with the Catholics. So he was very much, we need to stop this constant religious warring, which is attractive. That is an attractive view to us, obviously. But increasingly in his day, had people saying, well, what a coward. He, d- he doesn't even want to go over there and kill Catholics, the coward. <laughs> um, Nobody likes sort of the peaceful monarchs in their own time at this yeah, time. It's yeah. a very, very strange um, thing to look at from where we stand now. But, you know, James, would, he, you know, he's got the King James Bible. He is that that King James. Yeah. But he also writes to the Pope and calls himself, you know, like his sort of faithful son and all of this sort of yeah. stuff as well. Yeah. So he was trying to be all things to all men, especially in the 1590s. In the run-up to um, the succession, he 
he wanted as wide a support base as possible. He wanted the Catholics to want him. He wanted the Protestants to want. Him. Basically, he wanted to be everyone's friends so that no one would oppose him. Yeah. But um, in addition to this peace view, I, I am the great peacemaker. He really wanted political union between Scotland and England. That was his other big and, as it turned out, um, chimeric goal. He wanted a kind of political union that has never existed. So he not only just didn't get one in his time, it never happened. I think probably because his perception of union was, again, let's just make Scotland English. Because he thought, again, England is settled, everyone's obedient to the, the monarch, and the monarch gets to control the church. Let's have that in Scotland as well. And there was no appetite for it in England or Scotland. Why, why can't you behave like these guys here? Just stop, yeah. stop doing yeah. everything that you've been doing for ever. Yeah, and, and he people. said as much on his one visit. So when he left Scotland, he, he lied. He lied. He said he would be back every few years. In fact, he only came back once. Yeah, he came back in 1617. And he delivered a lecture to the Scots <laughs> saying, you know, you should really stop behaving like the English and smoking and in dressing in fancy ways and start behaving like them in other ways, like being me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good luck with that, James. Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> so what are his key relationships in England? Because this is this is a big thing for James. And we, we kind of skipped over because we talked about um, Esme Stewart mm. as, as a sort of grooming mm. um slash sexual awakening slash you know boy becomes man moment mm. but he really sets the tone for how james operates doesn't he yes um so during the marriage to anna um as far as we know he was faithful in scotland this is uh, with one exception where he seems to have cheated on her with a, with a woman actually um but before that, before he'd married her, he'd had a succession of, of boyfriends. So between Esme Stewart um, and Anna, there were a, a changing guard of, of attractive young men. When he came to England, that loyalty to Anna seemed to fade fairly quickly. And he kind of reasserted his inherent bisexuality. So once again, we start getting references to lots of attractive young men that he's interested in. Mm -hmm. But he remains clearly sexually invested in Anna because they continue producing children in England, although sadly those children are they die in infancy. Yeah. It's only when he meets his um next big love, Robert Carr, that he um he he really sort of starts to not distance himself from Anna. That's another thing that has kind of annoyed me. There's a lot of stuff being written in the past that, oh, when James went to England, he and Anna led separate lives. They didn't. They, they lived the same kind of lives as Henry VIII and his wives, uh, as um, lots of monarchs and their wives lived, where they would have separate households, yes. And certainly he went off to the country a lot hunting, which she didn't always go with him. Um, but they were still very much a couple. There was no getting rid of that. She was still queen. Yeah. But he did start relying on um, this reputedly very attractive young Robert Carr. And he almost made him, he didn't make him secretary. He didn't give him that official post. But the guy became de facto se secretary. So one of the problems, I think, with James was when he, when he liked you, he really, really liked you. <laughs> he became besotted with Carr. He showered honours on him. Um, he was almost kind of, uh, now I'm not going to use the word grooming because one point I make in the book is that James kind of became like Esme and that he would take young men under his wing, but Esme did it to a child. James never, ever did anything like that. James's um, long-term male relationships in England were always with men old enough to consent, men who, who kind of chose to share his bed, share his, his life. Um, not altruistically, obviously, they, they were getting rewarded very well for it. 
But um, Carr quickly became very unpopular with Anna as, as much as anyone because he was amassing a lot of power. Um, he was succeeded in James's affections by your friend Villiers, um, George Villiers. But that was made easy. It was easy for Villiers to slot in because one of the, I think, almost cute, that's the right word, things about James's relationship, he, he genuinely didn't mind his, um, his male lovers marrying. They were expected to marry. It was, you know, his view was, well, yeah, you have to marry, you have to found your own perpetuate your own dynasties but Carr made a, a mistake he actually loved his wife and came she was like no, I, I expected you to marry I didn't expect you to like her or love her um and it was therefore easier for Villiers to be slotted in yeah um, so yeah Carr's lost interest in you he's he's really into his wife now so, <laughs> so this is very much his this is his his way of operating isn't it you know you are he has favorites and they are promoted above all others mm -hmm. perhaps not to you know not necessarily to an official role like chancellor or anything like that it's more powerful than that because you've got you've got the king's ear and everything else yeah. um yeah. you you are the person who whispers in his ear all the time yeah yeah uh, and that's therefore unsurprising that the court began to get a reputation for corruption because first car or, or Somerset as it became very elevated to uh, Somerset uh, just as Villiers was elevated eventually to the dukedom of Buckingham mm. uh, but these guys were clearly going to be feathering their own nests once they were in that position of having the king's ear having power who wouldn't right I'm going to make this work for me I'm going to earn everything I can whilst I can now, the court, I think, had always been corrupt. Under Elizabeth, there had been all kinds of corruption. But later on in James's reign, it became very easy to point to certain people like Villiers, like uh, Somerset before him, Carr before him. Um, people were able to say, this is the source of the problem. This corrupt person in the king's bed with the king's ear. Um, so I think that's, again, one of the reasons maybe why... Um, he's not as fondly remembered because people think, oh, he oversaw this horribly corrupt court. And so did every monarch, but he just had a lot of satires written against it because there were these clear figures that libelers could write things about. I love it. So oh, we love controversy here on History Hack, and we never avoid it because uh, we're bitchy and gossipy <laughs> and we're not sorry. But long-standing theory that James was murdered by his love for the Duke of Buckingham. What are your thoughts on this? Ah, yes, this is a, a, such a popular theory that I believe they are making a TV show um, about it. Yeah, Julianne Moore, I think. Yeah, yeah. I'm looking forward oh, to it. I'm sure they'll wear Jan Boleyn in it somewhere as well. <laughs> <laughs> Flashbacks, yeah. yeah. Don't worry. The ghost I, I of Anne Boleyn, Boleyn narrating it. I yeah. Anne Boleyn a lot in the wisest fool. I got a lot of Anne Boleyn references in. Um, no, he wasn't poisoned, or at least not intentionally. So the theory is that um, Buckingham poisoned James with Charles's, James's son Charles's complicity because after a rocky start, Buckingham was kind of welcomed into the Stuart family fold. As I say, James, and I keep going back to this, James was obsessed with this idea of family. So after Anna died in 1619, James started writing to Buckingham, my sweet wife and child. He really had that weird incestuous thing again. But Charles became friendly with Buckingham and that, that friendship would survive James. So the theory is that the pair of them poisoned him because he was too pro-Spanish. James, James was very pro-Spanish towards the end of his life. He wanted a Spanish match for Charles. So did Charles, in fact, until he went to Spain and then came back cured of that. <laughs> um, but uh, James still wanted it. So the theory is that they thought, right, well, we'll just kill him and then we can do whatever. You're king once we kill him and we can do what we like. But it was nonsense. It was Joe Spanish Habsburg propaganda that really was trying to denigrate and ruin 
Buckingham in the wake of James's death and really trying to destabilise Charles in later years when it was revived. That said, there are lots of shady, true stories about what Buckingham and his mother were up to in James's bedchamber in his final days. They were giving him strange medications. They were bringing in a strange doctor. My view is that was a desperate roll of the dice. They weren't trying to poison him. They were actually trying to save him. It was a gamble um, and it didn't pay off. But I, I think they were genuinely trying to effect a cure for James because if they had saved him, I mean, the guy was dying anyway. He'd, he'd had multiple, we think, strokes. He was um, extremely unwell. If they could have effected a cure and saved him, Buckingham's credit would never have been higher. He would have saved the king's life at a really crucial moment. Instead, now we don't know if those, because early modern medicines were, they were as apt to kill you as cure you oh, anyway, gosh, yeah. probably more likely to kill you. Mm. But I don't think there was any malicious intent. I don't think they were trying to poison him, quite the opposite. What actually finally did him in? Did the medicines help either the ones from Buckingham or even the ones from James's own possessions? Could probably have killed him. Um, mm. I mean, when James, one person we didn't really talk about was James's son, Prince Henry, who died was- in 1612. Um, I mean, when he was dying, whether it was of um, typhoid, malaria, the doctors were like, getting live chickens and slitting them down the spine and putting them on his head. Yeah. <laughs> that, that'll cure him. <laughs> put, put a dead chicken on his head. When Anna was dying, the doctor said, oh, go out and chop down wood. Right, that'll cure you. <laughs> it's, it's, it's terrifying because they are in so many ways, you know, they're doing well. They've got they've got some really good understanding, but some of the the cures and some of the interventions, you just think it sounds it's torturous. I mean, yeah, yeah, you, you die of they doctors. Cures bizarre. My, my favorite is always um, if a woman wants to avoid pregnancy, she should wear a dry weasel's testicles and <laughs> string around her neck. I mean, it scares people off. It works every it does, time. It does, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, crazy. I like when you can see a kind of twisted logic, but some of them are just like. I just wonder if someone got you? rich off of literally letting weasel testicles and flogging them. Yeah, how, I... yeah. How do you get the testicles off a weasel anyway? <laughs> I shudder <laughs> to think. I think you. I mean, get... there's a load of castrated weasels running <laughs> around Scotland, going, "What have I done wrong with my life?" Yeah, I've got all some guy in a periwig. What am I going to do? Come and take them my nuts off me. <laughs> <laughs> Terrifying, but you know that sometimes the logic makes perfect sense in the weirdest way. Jesus I mean, sense, yeah, yeah. I mean a, a Catherine of Braganza, she had a a fever that was you know, making her delirious, and they wanted to draw the fever away from her head, so mm. they tied pigeons to her feet. <laughs> And it's just something about, okay, I can see what you're trying to do. Yeah, yeah, no, that, exactly. <laughs> when you can see the logic, it's like, yeah, I can see. I like how your mind works. I mean, it's, it's wrong. But... <laughs> it's absolutely terrifying. I mean, yeah, it's... it's. I hope there's an element of a, like, what's the stupidest thing we can tell people and they'll believe it? <laughs> if I was adopted, I, I think I would have. Well, that's, yeah, let's let's see what I can get them to believe. Mm-hmm. And then you go to your doctor friends, but... He's actually doing it. They're actually doing it. Go and lick a goat. It'll <laughs> make you feel better. Where on the go? Amazing. Look, we digress. Let's get back to <laughs> let's get back to King James, who I definitely think has had a good thorough looking at in um in your book, Stephen. I think it is Thank you. absolutely fantastic. So if you're gonna sell sell him to people who think he's a dribbling cod piece scratching um lotto lout um why do we need to look at him again i think one of the reasons we we really ought to look at james again is because he was and i'm not just saying this because i have a book to sell but having written that book he is probably the most colorful monarch that i've read about written about thought about which i would never have believed before i started that book i mean one of the things that really surprised me was some of the perceptions of, for example, Henry VIII. You know the old view of Henry Bluff King Howe 
like mm. chowing down at the table, throwing bones and things, just being this big, colourful figure. Mm-hmm. There's a reason that that image originated in the Jacobean period. It's because it was King James. They were writing about the king they knew. So yeah. a, lot of, um, a lot of the really colourful, uh, certainly colourful private life, a lot of the stuff we think we love and know about the Tudors, didn't they have interesting private lives? Didn't they have weird beliefs? All of this stuff, it's there in James times 10. So if you like the Tudors and you want more colourful, weird, um, interesting royal history, James is your man because he's it's just all there. Fantastic. And I can tell you all, listeners, by um, by personal recommendation that Stephen has completely brought James to life in a way that I've never appreciated before. So The Wisest Fool, The Lavish Life of James the Sixth and First is available as of the 4th of September. Alex, can we put it in the bookshop? Absolutely, we can. Fantastic. And thank you so much for joining us, Stephen. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, Charlotte. Thank you, Alex. Really enjoyed it. Thanks a lot. Our incredible guests give us 45 minutes of their time to join us and talk about their work or their new book. This is just a small taster. As a result, we have launched our very own bookshop on bookshop.org, where you can find our guests' latest books, you can support them, and you can support us on History Hack. 10% of every sale via our bookshop supports the podcast and allows us to keep going and bring you more top-of-the-line guests. You can find our bookshop at bookshop.org forward slash shop forward slash history hack or search for us in the shop section thank you so much for your continued support we really appreciate our listeners and supporters so make sure you get down to the bookshop and grab yourselves a new book